Hi, this is Hamdeep. This video is to teach you the basics of ladder logic so you can read and understand what it is doing for your system. I've worked on many projects where simple rungs of logic had to be edited. My goal is for you to be able to read and understand the logic changes. This way, you can make sure, as an engineering project manager, that the final product will meet your project requirements and objectives. I also want you to be able to discuss about programming changes with programmers and technicians instead of just hoping that they will get it done right. I don't want you to read the whole program just to keep us that are concerned with meeting the design requirements. With installations done mainly on weekends, there's very little time for troubleshooting. So your preparation should include reviewing the program. First, we'll look at the different contexts that you'll most likely encounter. Next, we'll look, we'll look at how to use and or logic with those contexts. Third is how inputs and outputs are labeled and numbered. Lastly, I'll explain the usage of test bits for safe implementation of projects. Just as a disclaimer, my background in PLC ladder logic is mainly with Toyopa, which is Toyota's PLCs. I also had limited exposure to Allen Bradley PLCs. Even though the terminal, terminologies and symbols might be different, I am sure that the knowledge is transferable to any PLC system. Before going through this video, please make sure you have gone through my basics of sensors video and understand the different types of sensors and how they work. Let's look at the different types of contacts we have. We have normally open contacts. That contact will be energized whenever the requirements are met. For example, if it is a proximity switch, the call will be energized whenever that proximity switch detects a metal part. On the other hand, normally closed contacts would be energized when the proximity switch does not detect a metal part. This will all, of course depend on how your field device is working, whether it is a normally open or normally closed device, which will reverse when the normally open contacts and the normally closed contacts will energize. Just be aware of this. Timers and counters are used extensively in programs. In order to prevent calls from energizing randomly when the requirements are met for let's say 0.1 seconds, we usually put timers with inputs that are detecting the components. For example, I might want my skillet to be in a lifter for at least 0.5 seconds before the system considers the skillet to be present. An example of a way counter would be used is sending every other card to the left. Or I could just be counting the total number of cards going through a system. Next are the internal coils. These coils are not linked to any physical components. They are just used inside the logic. In Toyopuck, those coils have a letter M in front of them and basically energize however we configure them to be. Lastly, keep coils, keep contacts, stay energized or de-energized de until they are changed. That means that even if the equipment is powered off, that bit will stay on or off as it was. We can always set up conditions to reset them. I've seen them used as test bits, which we will cover later in this video. Next, we look at NO logic. For the internal coil to energize, all of the contacts in front of it need to be energized. I see it as energy having to reach the final coil. In order for that to happen, the requirement of energization for each contact has to be met. Let's look at this example right here. There are two ways that M21E can be energized. In both cases, M111 has to be energized. It can be M111, M011, and X23A being energized simultaneously for M21E to be energized. Or it can be M111 and M013 only. Keep in mind here that X23A is a normally closed contact. Whatever the requirement for that call is, it would have to be energized. M21E in turn could be part of another rung of logic where it needs to be energized along with others in order to energize another coil. When the contacts are in series, they are using the N logic. All of these have to be energized. When they are in parallel, they are using the O logic. Either line of contacts have to be energized for the requirements to be met. Let's move on to inputs and outputs. These contacts will be named according to their addresses where the physical device is connected. In Allen Bradley PLCs, the inputs start with an I and the outputs start with an O. In Toyopak, the inputs start with an X while the outputs start with Y. 
The number after these letters is the address where it is wired. The inputs and outputs can never have the same number. For example, they can only be X23A or Y23A. Both will never appear in the same PLC and or program. If an input card is installed in that location inside the control panel, only input devices can be wired there. Similarly, if an output card is installed there, only output devices can be wired. We will cover more of this on a video about PLC control panels. Lastly, let's talk about test bits. They are basically keep contacts inside the program controlled by the user. They are turned on or off manually. They stay that way even when the control panel is restarted because they are keep contacts. Using the same example, I could only allow one of the logic conditions to possibly be completed. Here we added the K051 as the test bit. As long as we keep it off, only this upper logic can be met. When we turn the test bit on, only this lower logic can be met. This is very useful when adding new lines of codes. All the new codes can be kept behind a test bit. We can, we can turn the test bit on in order to trial the new lines of codes. If there's any issue, we can just turn it off. In the manufacturing world, this is critical in order to avoid production downtime. To conclude this video, I hope that you can now read ladder logic and understand what is taking place within the system. Understand what requirements need to be met before an action is taken by the system. The best way to learn about ladder logic is to take a program from your company's PLCs and go through it. Find a few inputs whose addresses you know about and search for them. Look at how they are used. When are they becoming active or inactive? They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. The best way to communicate your program requirements to a programmer is to use ladder logic as your picture. Again, not the whole program, but the core requirements that involve the field devices you're concerned with. Let's look at this example. I'm modifying the carrier from this type to this type. I want the system to kick the modified carrier left and the non-modified carrier to the right. In order to differentiate between the two, I added one laser sensor that has a different output which is an input to the PLC for each range that is manually configured. There's a proximity switch to ensure that the carrier is in the right location. If I wanted to communicate that requirement to a programmer, I would send him this type of logic. Of course, this can be improved by adding timers for each device to ensure that the requirements are met for at least some time before the contact is energized. The programmer would of course take care of this, take care of all the details, but you can communicate your requirements this way. Finally, remember to back up any program before you make changes. That should be the first step in your planning of a programming change. I added a link to a PDF I found online right below the video. If you're interested in understanding each of these deeper, but just to the next level instead of going through a massive book, that PDF will be useful. I also recommend project managers managing projects that involve programming to take at least one programming class. That will help them develop an understanding of how logic works in programming.